Welcome to my humble abode. I'm Yogi the Tail Spinner, and this is Tales of a Copy. The channel where we start the day with an additive tale and a cup of coffee in the hope of welcoming a blessed day. We return now to the life and suffering of Sir Brandt, Sir Yorkie Brandt to be precise, as he continues through his childhood. I'm confused. Oh, that's the day before. Okay. Four years old. I'm progressing. The <coughs> newborn's cry. You eyed the little bundle in your father's arms with curiosity. Behind the many layers of swaddling clothes is your newborn baby brother. Mother is glowing and smiling with joy. Stefan and Gloria are also here, all excited. You promise yourself that you're going to be the best big brother in the world. You'll never hit him. Oh no, the two of you will play together and tease Stefan together. And help Mother together. And go on so many adventures. Went to you, it should be I. Uh, it feels so strange to be an older brother. Just the other day I was the youngest in the family. But everything is different now. Interestingly, from what I've seen of the game so far, it's more likely that Stefan and he will team up against me and Gloria, since we are commoners and they are nobles. Your parents name your little brothers Nathan and mother spends day and night by his side. And Nathan cries all the time day and night. Mother barely gets any sleep. She's so worn out she starts forgetting things. Like today for instance she forgot her nutting in her armchair in the sitting room. You'd better bring it back to her as soon as possible. You run to Mother's bedroom, in which I smile so much. You walk in without saying hello and give her the knitting. Instead of gratitude, she get, you get an ice-cold, exhausted stare. Nathan is also there, screaming all the time. Go away, Yorkie, you're bothering me. Poor excels to woman, but that hurt. Spits these words out through her teeth. You look at the bawling newborn. Can't even get a minute of respite. Dear Bant, stay up already. When are you going to stop? I just want some peace and quiet. Mother leaps across the room and starts shaking Nathan with malice and rise. His cries get louder. She looks so tired from his never-ending screams. He seems to be within an inch of smashing him against the wall. Somebody has to do something. You're scared of your mother right now. But you fear Nathan's life much more. I could call father for help, but honestly, the way father's behaving, I'm not sure that's a good move. I could try and redirect her anger to myself. I can take it, if I have to. I don't wish to, though. I could snatch Nathan from mother. And escape. I could hug her, but I cannot. Nathan, I shall protect you, and Mother, I will give you peace. I, I will look after him. I will try. You leap at your mother and demand she give you Nathan. She freezes when she hears the word. You snatch your little brother out of her arms. She chokes with rage and falls on the bed screaming. You run away to a playroom. Your baby brother is heavy in your arms. He sniffles. You sway gently like Mother Dayton. Quietly sing her a lullaby about the twins. Nathan calms down. Soon he closes his eyes. You put the newborn on your bed and swear on your life that no one will ever hurt him when you're around. You hear heavy footsteps in the hallway. Father enters at the playroom. He looks at you, then at Nathan, somewhat confused. You did something bigger than you today, son, he says. It is a noble deed to protect your family, but you should have come to me. Please understand this is my duty, not yours. Father, you can be aggressive. You can be mean at times. I cannot tell him that though. You save your baby brother from harm. If you feel yourself ready to take the responsibility to protect others, then maybe you can walk the path of the noble when you're older. But for now, we should bring him back to your mother. Come with me. He picks Nathan up. Your brother is fast asleep, breathing quietly. The three of you return to mother's bedroom. Father puts Nathan back in the crib. Mother is no longer screaming. She embraces you. I need to get back to reading with I. Sorry. Please forgive me. The twins know I was out of my mind. 
Please don't be angry with me. I hugged my mother in response. I understand she was upset. I know that was wrong of her. Sympathy from Nathan. Uh, going up to, uh, going up. Grateful. Okay. Your brother, younger brother remembers what you did by him. Ow, he's a newborn. I lost five willpower though. I took a bold action because it had an impact. Nathan's birth, 1122. My younger brother Nathan is born. And so we go to 1123, the end of the fifth year of my life. Toy soldiers. I wake up to father's touch on my shoulder. He's finally back home after a long trip. Yorkie, today is your special day, the day when you begin your studies. Now teachers will be coming to our home to teach you, he say. And you must do everything they say. Be diligent in your studies and you will grow closer to the no nobleman's lot. <clears throat> and since you must remember this day, our present is in order. Lydia, get our little schoolboy dressed. I'm taking him to the market district. Exciting. What are we going to get? Stefan wants to come with you, with me too, uh, but the father shushed him sternly. This is my day. My elder brother is hurt to hear this, but stays quiet. An open carriage takes the two of us through the dusty, noisy city streets. A pleasant wind tussling my hair. Our city is called Anizot. Uh, that, I, that I already know. It is one of the largest cities in the entire empire. There is a big shadow on the streets. It comes from the white foliage of an enormous tree that spreads its branches all over the city. My son, said my father, did you know that the silver tree grew from the blood of our God's own disciples? It has been growing here for hundreds of years, right in our city. It cannot be damaged or burned. Not even the clergy know why. The carriage comes to a halt by a small shop next to a city square. I run there and freeze by the stalls in excitement. The shop is packed with dolls and figurines and toys. I've never seen so many at once before. Have you chosen your present yet? Father asks. I have. I want the Holy Order set, which includes several figurines from the Empire's greatest warriors of all time. I rattle off everything I know about the Holy Order. They were the ones who aided the Emperor's own forces in seizing the province of Magra and storming the city. That's how we joined the Empire. Father nods in approval. Very well, war isn't your lot now, but maybe these toy soldiers will teach you to think like a general. We will lead them into battle and study military strategy. Go ahead, take a present. I like that he doesn't think of an established lot. Unlike Muller, I might have a chance with him. I feel myself growing closer. Having said this, father turns away to examine the box. I run to the box of toy soldiers, delirious with excitement. But there is a fancy dressed boy in my way. He's about to take my warriors for himself. He elbows me aside and reaches for the box. Anger overcomes me and I push him from behind. My opponent falls to the floor. The rich boy screams so loud that everybody in the shop hears it. He hit me, he hit me. The tall tower of a man looms over me. This is the boy's father. Then I feel my own father's hands on my shoulders. What happened? I press against father. My mind more at ease now. He will protect me. Yes, you shoved the boy to the floor in front of everyone, but he tried to take your present for himself. Father turns you around to face him when he hears these words. Is this true, Yorkie? Did you strike the son of a nobleman? Well, I admit my guilt. It's not my fault. I tell my father that I repaid the impudent boy in kind. Mm. It isn't fair to blame you without letting it would blame me without letting me speak to you. I didn't want to shove that stupid boy, he was the one who shoved me first. The angry nobleman, the boy's father, will not let me finish. Nobody cares a whit for my so called truth, little lowborn. 
The law is the law, and your punishment is due. Yo, my father nods in agreement to these words, no matter how sad they make him. They lead me and the nobleman's son out of the shop. I'm told to bow to him and show humility. A bad feeling sends a shiver down my spine. This is wrong. This is wrong, father. I thought you would protect me in life. What is this? With a satisfied grin on his face, the boy swings his arm and slaps you across the cheek. He strikes me again and again. Enough, says father. He got what he deserved. We're leaving. Get out of our way. My head is swimming from the heavy blows. I return to my senses, back in my bed, with servants treating my face. Father stays by my side all, all day. Why are you here, father? You did nothing to protect me. The morning after, I find a little box on my bed with tin soldiers of the Holy Order inside. I paid dearly for my stubbornness, but I am more determined now. I am active. No longer spineless. Eleven twenty-four, yeah, my sixth year. Eleven twenty-four, summer, the family dinner. Today, father ordered the dinner table to be brought out into the yard. For the first time in months, he's home outside of the confines of his always locked study. He spent the entire day playing with Nathan and me, discussing various matters with Stefan, now an adolescent, and walking in the garden. And now a dinner under the open sky. My entire family gathers around with father at the head of the table, smiling. He asks each of us about our studies. Nathan climbs up on his knee and recites a counting rhyme in a funny, sing-song voice. Stefan mentions that his fencing teacher praised his accomplishment. He rises from the table together with father to show his skill in a practice duel. Next comes Gloria's turn. She stands on a chair and recites a lengthy prayer by heart. Mother shows my sister uh, shows my sister with praise. Father chuckles quietly, hiding a smile in his moustache. When my turn comes, I recite all the ranks in the Legion, from common soldier to high commander. Stefan listens to me with a sceptical look on his face. Night slowly falls, but the servants ensure that the yard is well illuminated. I don't feel cold in the dust tonight. It feels good, yet so important. All of us are finally together, sitting at the same table. No fighting, just smiles. No arguing. Just pleasant small talk. A good family meal for once. Then a servant approaches father with a letter in his hand. He reads it in the dim light and each line gradually washes a smile off father's face until only a dull cold mask remains. Mother looks at father with an unspoken question in her eyes. Gregor Brandt is coming back to Anizot, says Robert Brandt. He's the head of our family, my father. Grandfather? I don't know him. Grandfather's return, 1124. My grandfather, Gregor Brandt, returned to the family home from the capital. The intrusion. Ever since the news of Grandfather's impending arrival, there has not been a single day when the house has not been cleaned or decorated. My parents anxiously make sure everything is in order. They tell us to wash... They tell me to wash my face and hands and walk... and... after walks and scold me for leaving books on the floor. They tell Gloria she'll be flogged if she is ever seen hiding in the attic. They make Stefan stay in his room. Even baby Nathan gets in trouble. Everyone is on edge. Then one day, Grandfather arrives. It is a grim day, so hot. Nick is sticky with sweat. Father, mother, Stefan, Gloria, me, and Nathan. The entire Brandt family stands on the porch in front of the house. The house servants lined up behind us. The carriage arrives and out fits a tall, gaunt man with a heavy walking stick and a heavier gaze. I cringe instinctively. This man is frightening. What is going on? Good health to you, father, says my father. Children, think your grandfather has been taught. Still trying to look like a real nobleman, are you? You can't fool me, Robert, says Gregor. I was the first of the Brandt family to be ennobled by the mantle, and I am the only one who remembers how to bear this burden properly. I live honourably by my lot, says my father. 
You're managed to have lowborn wench, cut us off from ever becoming nobles of the sword, says Gregor. My progeny could have been born bearing noble blood. Father, I beg you, this is not the place, says Father. Grandfather eyes him with scorn and walks into the house, the entire family following close behind him. I have been away far too long, says Grandfather. The entire house is a mess. This is an insult. How can you live in such a pigsty, Robert? The servants have grown far too lazy, all thanks to your commoner of a wife. I'm angry at him talking about mother like that. I warned you, did I not? And yet you did as you saw fit. And the children? What do they know of tradition or honour? I'd wager more than you do, old man. They are being raised in a virtuous family, father, says my own father. And now you're speaking like a lowborn who's content to live in humility, says Gregor. Twins willing, now that I am here, this will not happen again. I am taking your eldest son to the capital. I see you cannot provide Stefan with a proper education, so I will correct your mistake. He is taking my brother? I have many a reason not to particularly like my brother, but this is ridiculous. My brother's face has been decided just like that. Father does not object. He orders the servants to prepare Stefan for the journey. Father? Do you not protect any of us anymore? Stefan freezes in place, glancing at Grandfather and Father again and again. The latter puts a hand on his shoulder, reassuringly. Grandfather's lips are a tight line, white with contempt. The house is examined room after room. Everything Grandfather sees is shoulder with scorn. He scoffs at a crease on a blanket in Nathan's crib in Mother's bedroom. He mocks Gloria's knitting in her room. The door to my room is next. What is this, Robert? he asks. Tin soldiers in your younger son's room. He was born a commoner. I won't have him daydreaming of battle. You old fool. I will be more the noble than you will ever be. And more a follower of the twins true messages. <laughs> Grandfather seizes the box containing the tin warriors of the holy order. My father stays silent. Anger and fear boil within me. This is my big present from the first day of my studies. It means so much to me, but what if he's right? What if he ne I need to prove my right to command the toy soldiers first? Grandfather shakes his head in disapproval and shoves a toy box into the roaring fireplace. If I wait too long, they will melt in the flames. You are an old fool, Grandfather, and I will not have you destroy my stuff like this. I do not have determination strong enough. I do not have perception strong enough. Kick his leg. Overwhelmed by the helpless rage, you run to the Grandfather and kick him in the leg with all the strength you can muster. Yet he is immovable. The next thing you see is him leaning, towering over you menacingly, his heavy walking stick in hand. Lowborn scum, how dare you raise a hand to me, he demands. The blow hits home, bringing blood. The handle of the walking stick is as heavy as a rock. I am dazed, robbed of both hearing and sight. Down comes another blow, a sharp pain splits my head, then darkness. My hand twitches against my will. Then again and again it is trying to catch a butter uh, flying butterfly, and then I fall into the primordial void. The void takes away part of you, one of the lives you were given to live. It will never return. There is peace and desperation, a sense of loss. <laughs> Nothing can be done now. The first death. I fall into a pain that embraces me like a soft feather bed. I feel light, free. There are no restraints, just a warm glow that envelops me in its secure embrace. The waves carry me, their soft touch, uh, touch is soft. I delicately enshroud what was once my body. It is a feeling unlike anything I have ever experienced before. Something absolute and complete. I touch something greater than the reason behind everything. The reason for my very existence. I was sculpted from this light. It was the first thing I ever felt. A boundless and uh, sincere unity of the diverse. My beginning was a spark that cast this light in all directions, and now I am here again. 
one with the beginning of everything. The light gleaming from me resembles the light of the shining pillar. I still see it in the north, as always. The waves of light carry uh, me to two figures. The eldest is nearest, he is ready to accept you. He is quiet, wise, kind and pure. The younger waits further back. I do not know what he is yet. The waves pause at the elder's feet. He leans over me and plants a feather like kiss on my forehead. The kiss spreads all over you. I am filled with an unparalleled delight and bliss. I exist. I am unique. There is no one else like me. They know this and they love me. I will never be alone. I am part of them, a part of my family, a part of the universe. The twin gods will never, never leave me. They watch over me constantly. The elder softly touches me as I lie spread out among the waves, sending me further down the torrent of light. I float on to the top of the silver tree spreading crown. The closer I get to the silver tree, the heavier I become. The waves draw me down along its trunk. But I do not wish to part with the warmth and the softness without with a love. I turn around. The elder is still watching me, he nods. All is as it should be. Go. My time has not yet come. I must return to the world now. As I tumble down toward my body, I comprehend the true meaning of my lesser death and the divine love that has been revealed to me. Love exists not only in the hereafter, it is present in the entire design of the twins that is the origin of all life in this world. What is the manifestation of this love in my mortal life? Is it empire, lot, family, cause, self? Empire, by creating the empire, the twin gods cared for all living creatures. The empire is the only thing that gives us a place in this world and a connection to others. It's an enormous family, made up for people by the gods. Lot, the gods gave me a clear mission in the world, thus giving uh, gifting me my very being. This is a manifestation of their love for me and all living things. Well, let's take these one by one. Not Empire. From what I have seen, authority is bad. Authority is not uh, is not living with the will of the twins. Look at how they embraced me uh, when I stood against it. The lot. The lot is mutable. Uh, they've shown that by welcoming me. Family. Love always lives in kindred blood. I share the miracle of life and the universe with my kin. My family is what I am given upon being born and what I leave behind when I depart. But mother would have harmed Nathan through being overwhelmed. Is that right? Father did nothing to protect um, Stefan or me. Grandfather killed me. How can I embrace family? There may be members of it I can love, but how can I embrace family? It is nothing but authority, miss you. Cause, the love of the gods have for you is so great that they allowed me to change the world they have created, to influence it with my deeds. Whatever my mission is, it is proof of the twin gods' love for me. Indeed, and this is what I see, things need to change, and I may be the catalyst. Myself, what could be a stronger manifestation of love than my very existence? My every emotion, every thought, every act, action exists by virtue of the love from which the twin gods created me. There is truth in that, but there are things bigger than me that I must attend to. And I do not find the answer I seek. No, it is cause. It is the cause I must pursue in life to live as a pious man and a holy boy. A sudden comprehension of the love which the entire world has imbued illuminates my mind and it fades and vanishes. I regain the sensation of my flesh. It is heavy and unwieldy. It lacks the lightness, that light. It is a burden. It is smothering me. I gasp for air. My chest expands painfully. I feel as though my lungs are about to burst. The stagnant odour of the crypt fills them, revolting but so real. I am back. Then I smell a sickly moist smell. I feel dampness all around me. I come back to my senses in the gloom of a family crypt lying flat on the stone slab. My parents are on their way to the crib right now. I hear their muffled voices. They are arguing, and against all rules, Mother will not agree with Father. Why would Sir Gregor do this? He just took one of our child's lives, she asks. 
Lydia, my father is like from this head, and the boy raised a hand to him. There was nothing we could do when father did admit that he was he was too hard on him. It was a violent slug, father. And you did nothing. Please do not anger, Sir Gregor. You need to accept this. It will never happen to any of our children ever again. Who says he did it once? He could do it again. Their voices grow quiet. They lean over me. I lean on my elbows to try and get up from the stone. Mother gently wraps her cloak over my naked body as I shiver from the cold. My son, my first death came far too soon. Uh, your first death came far too soon to say. I know it may be difficult to realize what happened, but know this, the twin gods are ever merciful. I'm a, you are a child, and your time to leave the, for the hereafter has not yet come. You will be returned here by the gods twice more, but do not attempt fate again, and never ever defy those who can easily take your life. Mother, I know there is protection in your words, but there is cowardice. Sometimes there are things more important than my life, I see that now. Yorkie, you have angered your grandfather greatly. Do not stand in Sir Gregor's way ever again, and he will never hurt you again. From now on, just stay away from him. <laughs> As long as he hurts none other that I love, none other that he shouldn't. Father stays a step away from you, not saying a word. When mother finishes talking, she picks you up and carries you outside. Together my parents take me from the family crypt. On our way out of the crypt, I take a moment to touch my, fork, my head. He's perfectly fine, there is no sign of a blow. Back home, grandfather is still walking through the house, examining the rooms. I can see that Stefan and Gloria are disturbed by what just happened. Nathan starts crying when he sees you. Sees me. The playroom still reeks of burnt paint. There is something new about me now. A pitch black stripe down my left arm. It looks like a strange bit of dirt at first, but it will not wash off. It will be like that forever, Mother explains. This is just the way of it. And my father has fallen into distaste. He dislikes me. So be it. <laughs> there is some... Oh. My determination has increased to three. I am active. And will soon perhaps be resolute. I have died once. My perceptions increased to four. Inquisitive. I must find a way in life. That is the way that things are. It must be sought. It must be found. It must be lived and experienced. Beyond. Events has happened. I suffered my first death. The small child you suffered your first death and rebirth. The event is a consequence of your previous actions. Conditions met perception for greater or equal to four. The ant farm. My younger brother Nathan is growing. Mother spent much time with the rest of the family now. I help her and play with my brother and take care of him when she asks. I often go to mother's room to sit at the foot of her bed after Nathan falls asleep. She reads me the sacred books. And ask me about the things you learned that I learned that day. During these moments I see the world through her eyes as well. One day the door of my room opens and she brings in a large box covered with a piece of cloth. It is rare for me to see her so overjoyed. She sets the box on the floor and moves the cloth. The box under the cloth is made of glass and has a wooden base. Inside I see a layer of earth shaped into carefully crafted passages. And these passages are full of hard working ants. Yorkie, this is my gift to you, an ant farm. It's a little world in a small box. We can watch them through our eyes, uh, through the glass through our eyes. Look, this is the queen ant. She is the reason all these little ants were born. I sit by the box. We sit by the box together. I hold my breath as I watch the ant colony at work. It turns out to be a method to the ants' chaotic movements. Every single one of them has a task to perform. Some of them have larger mandibles. They are the protectors of the colony. They can draw blood from your finger. Others work all around the colony, repairing the walls and cleaning any, clearing any debris from the passages. 
There are also workers who collect food. Uh, you, I put in a special tray, leaves, bits of meat, maggots, and bring it to the rest of the colony. I take a work around and put it next to the food. However, the insect has no interest in it. It starts circling the tray aimlessly. Mother takes the stray ants and puts it back where it belongs. Why did you do that, my son? The ants cannot do what they weren't born to do. Each of them was born for their own job. I shake my head slowly. If only the ants could do whatever they wanted to. This is my gift now, so they belong to me. Or maybe Mother's presence is the reason they won't obey me. No. No, I'm beginning to see. This is the way the Empire and Father wish us to be. But we are not mere insects. We are more than this mother. Still, there is joy to playing with her. Let's go outside together and find some bugs to feed the ants. Mother looks full of warmth and love. Nate and Gloria and Father are away right now. For the first time in a long while, it is just the two of us. And Mother takes great joy in watching over the ant farm. She shares her knowledge of the world with me. The things she tells me are true. I move closer to her and suggest going outside and finding some bugs for the ants. She agrees to this happily and holds my hand as we leave the house. Soon I am busy catching bugs and sharing my thoughts on how the ants will feed the colony with them. From time to time we laugh together, making up stories about errant flies and caterpillars overthrowing the ant kingdom. Me and Mother hold hands as we return to my room. She can't help but smile. It is a faint smile, a child smile, a smile full of sunlight. I am so happy to have seen the world through her eyes today. But I'm more happy to know that she doesn't see the world properly. That I've been right, the twins lead us in a different direction. Mother, these are ants. These are ants. They are beautiful creatures. And they do show that we must all fulfill roles. But we are not set in them as they are. That is a corruption of the twins' way. Will power plus five. Me and mother hold hands as we return. Oh, yes. So she loves us more, and we have regained some willpower. Year 1124, the fall of the master of the house. Soon grandfather returns. Uh, so soon grandfather leaves. My eldest brother Stephen goes with him. From that day on, father's hired teachers tend to me alone. They bore me with monotonous lectures on writing, counting, and the way of life in the Blessed Agnian Empire. I often distract myself from their instruction by playing with my younger brother Nathan. My home grows quiet without my elder brother, too quiet. Weeks later, my family receives a letter from Stefan. Grandfather has sent him to a boarding school for nobles, and he is now studying hard in preparation for his service as a nobleman. The rules here are way too strict. You can't even sneeze without the teacher's permission. But I've been studying with my peers. They're learning how to live as nobles in a noble society. We're also learning the art of swordplay. That's my favorite part. With Stefan now at the boarding school, grandfather arrives once more. This time to live in our home. The only good thing as he eats is, is that he often has urgent business in Eterna, the capital of the empire, and has to travel there. One day I asked Mother where he lived before. In eternity, she says, but now this is this now his place is here. Each time grandfather returns, he gives the servants new orders. Our home is now always busy with repairs. The servants are redecorating grandfather's chambers, including his library and sitting room. Sometimes father tries to gently talk him out of this. Why the subject of the house? Uh, to constant why subject the house to constant reconstruction? Grandfather's answer is always the same. This home is mine and I will live here as befits a man of nobility. This home is ours, old man. <coughs> and we will leave it there. Following the lessons of our first death. Join us next time as we continue to the end of childhood and entering adolescence. In the meantime, very well, my friends. Enjoy your coffee. And may you have a blessed day. <laughs>